Well, as you can see, I am actually back from work uh, the last couple days. I have been uploading videos that I recorded while I was at work, uh, and now I'm actually home. So this is going to be my first actual video that I'm recording at home after finishing work. And uh, <clears throat> the first video that I uploaded was about gun control, and then I uploaded a whole bunch of other videos basically about random other topics. Uh, some of those topics were not really that important. Uh, others, I think, were, but not directly related to gun control. Uh, and I kind of felt a little bit put off about that because I think gun control right now is the number one issue to be talking about and to be addressing. It's an issue that is probably the most uh, influential on my political development and the one I feel strongest about. Uh, and I was hesitant to upload videos that weren't dealing with that. It's just I didn't have any more videos about gun control uh, and I don't have a lot of time to um, you know, upload these videos as whenever I feel like it because at any point I could leave and I just assume get them out there before uh, before I have to leave and then can't upload them anymore. But I did want to talk, uh, since I've uploaded those, uh, Obama has come out with his executive orders and his um, he didn't cry this time, but more of his uh, political grandstanding on this issue, and I thought I'd I'd address uh, a couple things. Um, one about the executive orders, uh, and and if you're friends with me on Facebook, you saw that I posted about this. This is hardly something that can be said only of Obama. It's been something that's been going on gradually in a big way since Teddy Roosevelt although it certainly started before him, and it's just become much, much worse. Um, reading an article in The Guardian about what Obama might do about gun control, the article is basically saying Congress will not pass anything, which I think is likely. Even uh, pretty cynical gun control um, or gun advocates like Larry Pratt have said there's very little chance Congress will, will move on this. But The Guardian article said, well, Obama could issue a signing statement or an executive order, and that has, quote, the force of law. Well, if something has the force of law, it is functionally indistinguishable from law. And uh, I'm struck by, uh, it doesn't surprise me that the executive has this power. I'm struck with the, uh, the comfort that so many people seem to have with this concept, the idea that uh, a single man can um, issue out orders and that they be law. Uh, one wonders if I were or someone else was to contradict an order of the president, an executive order of the president, and what what crime would I be charged by? You know, did I I broke the law? I'm being punished because I didn't do what the president said. That's not even, you know, it seems so easy for them to get stuff passed in Congress. You know, even the laws they get that way are of dubious um, merit and justification. But to have just his words, um, it it really, I, I don't even, I mean, I'm just so sick of it now, I don't even know how to respond. It's just the idea that a president, and this is not just Obama, like I said, Bush was very bad about this, and it's been something that's been going on a long time. The idea that they can just issue forth edicts. Um, and I compared him to a king, which some people find objectionable. Uh, but the fact that he gets elected doesn't mean that he should have the power to legislate by fiat. That's the whole point of having a legislature. Um, so there's that element. Now, the second element is when he did actually... You know, he's launching a two-pronged thing. He's having stuff that he wants to have passed in Congress, which the odds of that getting passed are pretty low. Even in the Democratic majority Senate, Harry Reid has said he's not sure he can get it. The NRA has Harry Reid's balls and advice. Uh, he very likely would not have been reelected had they not supported him. Not only do they does he owe them, but if he goes against them now, then he will be out in the, in the next term. In all likelihood, Nevada is a pretty pro gun pro-gun state um you know he's not, he's not going to go to the bat to the president to the point where he will risk his own seat probably and he's not the only democrat who's in that position but um i was of course very worried about the content of these executive orders and 
I did a video last December basically called a warning to gun owners where I said I'd heard rumors and this isn't me being a great reporting there's been ruminations about this for a long time that Obama might um, issue an executive order and the fear was that he would classify all semi-automatic weapons as requiring a class 3 a federal license which would require people who wanted to keep them to pay a tax to get uh, fingerprinted to register uh, you know basically not a ban but the next best thing uh, none of his 23 executive orders as outrageous the idea of an executive order is do that uh, and just to sum them up none of them prevent anybody from buying or selling anything none of them ban anything that's currently in circulation now this isn't to say I'm happy with this because the precedent is said that all it takes is him to say more but one has to ask why didn't he do more and I think the question is obvious is he doesn't want to find out what will happen and I don't say that as like an empty boast thinking that if he did everyone would become like Mel Gibson and the Patriot and start a revolution I don't think that will happen or at least the odds of that happening are pretty small but I think what will happen is very many, if the government, what through executive order or legislative process, either way, seriously started to ban guns or to confiscate guns, most people would go along with it. But some fraction of people, and when you're talking about roughly 100 million gun owners, a fraction could be 15, 20 million, five, it could be millions of people, will not go along with it, which again doesn't mean that they will start a revolution a mil or you know an insurrection they will likely hide their guns run away and this is going to that would end up in shootouts there are people who are going to end up in shootouts probably many you know relatively speaking and what that would mean is unclear because very few people in the country favor an absolute gun ban so to have people dying to affect it to affect that would be um, totally unprecedented I mean the only thing it would be, not totally unprecedented the only thing I, I can think of that would be similar to that would be the Civil War now the Civil War was bigger in scale and there would be these different political so even that's not really analogous it's just the idea of the le level of antagonism towards the federal government that's the only thing I can think about that would be sort of like that, bad as that analogy is. Nobody is eager to f see that situation. Um, so I I'm sure Obama would love to ban all guns, but he does not want, you know, he that would be uncharted territory. They're not willing to risk it. So I think the strategy of his makes a lot more sense. Issue executive orders that are not going to be that controversial because, again, these aren't banning anybody. This sets a precedent, perhaps, for more incremental executive orders later. Um, I think this is more like, I mean, the fear was that they would basically go for broke, so to speak. Uh, and I think the risks in doing that would have been enormous, and I think they had judged that. And so rather than go for broke, I think it's, this is more of an attempt to just tighten the vice a little bit more, which is bad which is not something to be welcomed, which is something to be resisted. Um, but nonetheless, I was relieved in, the, in that sense that they weren't about to, you know, open Pandora's box, so to speak. Um, just for if no other reason than I didn't want to have to personally deal with it at this time, which I never want to be in a position where I have to deal with it. But we're getting to that point where, like, lines can be crossed that, you know what else can we do at some point your talk can only go so far so uh, I think that the the relatively narrow scope despite the fact that there's 23 of them of these executive orders uh, is a reflection of that now again this is just gonna now verge into um, a discussion of gun control generally because I think that um, if I'm gonna condemn his actions you know, I should justify why I don't consider these to be um, efficacious for, you know, uh, making a, a safer, better society. Uh, one thing he seems to have come out is a really strong, like, look, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have people die because of politics. We shouldn't, uh, 
you know, kowtow to a powerful lobby if it means saving lives. Uh, it's interesting that he's suddenly now coming out so strongly against gun control. Um, there's been many mass shootings since he's been president, uh, several at least as high profile as this one, and suddenly now he has this strong interest to do so. Now, when he was running for president in 2007 and in the election cycle in this last year, he said nothing about gun control. He was silent about the issue. Um, the only reason that I can see that it's suddenly now something he's willing to talk about is that he is now re-elected and he is a lame duck president, which means that all those other shootings, he didn't give a damn about whatever he might or might do to save the children because getting re-elected was more important. And this is basically uh, a toxic, toxic issue in democratic circles to run on. This is something that gives it energizes, and this is true, this energizes the Republican base. This is an issue that cross crosses political boundaries. Many Democrat there, there are some Democrats in really urban, very, very liberal cities who they can be anti-gun control. And so that's where Chuck Schumer and Dianne Feinstein and Carolyn McCarthy comes in. Many other Democrats are vulnerable on this issue. They have constituencies that even though they're democratic, they like to hunt, they like to own guns, and they are members of the NRA. The NRA spends a lot of money on Democrats. He's recently retired, but there was a, a, a congressman uh, from my state, Michigan, Bart Stupek, uh, a very large district in rural northern Michigan. He was a Democrat. He ran campaign commercials showing him uh, carrying a firearm saying, I will never do anything to take your guns because he voted once against the NRA on one vote and it was relatively minor and he almost lost re-election because of that. And so he, even though he was a Democrat, there is no way in hell he'd be voting for high capacity magazines or anything like that. So Obama didn't want to open that camera. He doesn't care about how many children are dying previous to his re-election, but once he's re-elected, oh, then suddenly it becomes something worth it. So his, his claims that he, he putting lives in front of politics are patently false. There's no, there's no other explanation for the timing of this other than he's reelected and it doesn't, he can't, he, he personally cannot suffer from this in, at least terms in terms of his own political career. Uh, fortunately, many of the legislatures he needs to pass stuff in the Congress, this isn't the case which is why it is very unlikely what he wants to get passed will go anywhere. Uh, second, well, this is probably even more important. It just always bears re-mentioning. He's a, suck, such a fucking hip, hypocrite. Right? He's drone striking. He's killing innocent people all over the world. It's a Sandy Hook a week, at least, being generous from drone strikes, not to mention just the military occupations, not to mention the military dictatorships in other countries that we support, the most politically incorrect one is Israel, but the list is much longer than that. And honestly, there are few people in the world today who have claimed to having uh, a bloodier, gore-filled uh, conscience than he should have. And yet he's going to come up and tear up because little American kids get killed. You know, it's lucky they're not Afghanistan kids because he kills them, you know, every day, seven days a week. Uh, and then gets sanctimonious about what a great job he's doing and blah, blah, blah. So that's probably the most important thing. That's even more hypocritical of him than uh, than than his waiting until he's reelected before he suddenly gets balls on this issue, which means he never had balls on this issue. Uh, the second thing, or kind of more technical, these these high-profile cases, these mass shootings, uh, are such a tiny fraction of gun control that the fact that they are the what frames the debate is uh, a fucking shame. And it shows that anyone who tries to frame the debate on this type of issue is not really interested in gun violence. Um, the number of mass shootings in this country in terms of the number of incidents and the number of people killed in them and uh, you know, how you define a mass shooting is debatable, but the FBI usually says three or more people at a single incident. Um, it's, 
the rate is not changed since about World War II. It's a constant rate. The the the, the uh, modus operandi of these are basically somebody for whatever reason goes crazy. Uh, they decide that they want to kill a lot of people. They this is a premeditated act, albeit by a deranged person. And there's a whole other debate of whether we should dismiss people for being der deranged or not. I don't want to get into that now. And there is literally nothing you can do that can legislate against the possibility of these people attempting this. If they can't use guns, they will use other means, as evidenced by Oklahoma City, by Bath, Michigan, which is still the greatest school massacre in, in U.S. history, even though it's almost 100 years old at this point, or 90 years old. Um, guns cannot be effectively um, restricted. A, even if you could somehow prevent the production and importation of all future guns, there's already about 300 million in the United States. But the idea that you can cur cur curtail production of guns within the United States is asinine. Guns can be produced in the United States. The information on how to do so is freely available. The expertise to do so is not what distributed evenly among everybody, but there are probably millions or at least hundreds of thousands of people who know how to do it right now. If there was a market to produce guns, that number would increase. The equipment necessary to do so uh, is too useful in other areas to be actually stopped. Also, importation of foreign weapons. Apparently, they can bring drugs, drugs in, people. They can bring guns in as well. And just the current stockpile of guns is so great that the idea that you're going to stop a committed person uh, from obtaining the means of destruction to start a rampage is totally asinine. Now, the other thing, the only thing that is going to stop these people is another person with a gun. Now, the police have really horrible um, response times, and they have very often are unwilling to put their lives on the line, which I appreciate, but I don't appreciate the fact that they go around saying, we're here to protect you, we're here to protect you, you need to support our authority and acquiesce to our our abuse of you. You have to give us leeway, uh, legal leeway. You have to respect us because we protect you. And then when you call out for their protection, they may or may not respond. There are cops who will. There are cops who won't. There are cops who will try, but because of incompetence, won't be able to. <laughs> just the other day, I was told uh, just really close by, a woman was abducted, attempted to be raped. She ran away. She broke into, she she got out of the car, she was chased by the rapist, she got into a house, and as it turned out, the house was occupied by a whole bunch of kids who called 911 first, and then they called their father, who was not there. And guess who got to the house first to save the kids? It was not 911, even though they got the call first, they can ignore all the traffic laws, and they have central dispatch, the dad got there first. He's the one who saved the day, and as it turned this. A uh, criminal decided to try and burn down the house to destroy the evidence. He set a fire. These people were cowering in the bathroom, um, unaware that the house they were in was set on fire. And fortunately, the father returned and was able to put it out and get them out. I don't know if the police would have gotten there in time to do it, but the police don't get there in time. And even when they do, they just fucking cower in the background a lot of time. That's what happened at Virginia Tech. He was going through, and at Columbine, the police were on site before the massacres were over and did not intercede. So there is no, and of course there are no legal obligation for them to do so. You cannot sue them if they fail or don't even try. So the only thing that is going to stop these people is another person with a gun and that person is probably going to have to be a civilian. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to have a gun or we should mandate, and this is the big conflation, the hyperbolic conflation that gun control advocates always point out. Oh, you want everyone to have a gun? No. I want people to have an option. I don't want everyone to have a Camaro, but if people want to buy one, they should be able to. I don't think everyone should be forced to hunt white-tailed deer, but if they would like to, I think they should be allowed. I don't think everyone should be forced to own a gun, but if they think it's necessary for their defense, then they should be allowed to purchase and carry one. And if they don't think it's necessary for their defense, then they should not be forced to do so. All I'm asking is that they be given a free choice, but that apparently is way too much freedom to be allowed, at least according to the thinking of some.
fortunately not too high a proportion of the population, but some at least. Now, these mass shootings, there's just not a lot we can do. Now, one thing that is stands out about them is they always occur with one exception in gun-free school zones, or it's gun-free zones. If your intent is to maximize death, then it makes sense to attack places that will be defenseless. Given the proliferation of concealed and open carry, mostly concealed carry, in the United States, that means you have to go to a place where they are specifically prohibited. Schools, uh, some churches, sometimes uh, like the movie theater in Colorado, Ann Coulter uh, pointed this out. I don't really like Ann Coulter very much, but she said, look, uh, James Holm fellow, there were several theaters that were closer to him, to where he lived, that he drove past to go to that theater because that was the theater that had posted no guns are allowed. All the other ones, it was ambiguous or they explicitly allowed it, so he picked that one. I mean, maybe there is some other criteria he used, but as far as, you know, it's plausible because it fits the pattern. The only exception to this is the Gabriel Giffords mass shooting, which I have to say the Gabriel Giffords mass shooting was more an assassination that failed, by the way, uh, that transitioned into a mass shooting. He was going to attack her wherever she was, and she was in a place where concealed carry was legal. Other than that, they always happen in gun-free zones. They don't happen in places where guns are available. So the idea that you know we should just give them more targets doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, just a, a more general discussion of violence in the United States. Uh, 80% about of the homicides are black on black. If you are white in the United States, then the homicide rate for you is about the same as it is in all, like, in Belgium, uh, and my, some of my subscribers are going to know where I'm getting this because it was recently figured in another prominent YouTube video um, that I'll just imply that you know what it is. But uh, the vast majority of the homicides in the United States, they occur in just a few urban centers and even within those urban centers within just a few areas. So like Detroit is pretty bad, but even in Detroit, most of the homicides are happening in certain neighborhoods. There's parts of Detroit that never really see homicides. Chicago, uh, New York City, LA, uh, a couple other cities, certain areas in them have really high crime. And those areas, by the way, don't correlate with the gun culture of the United States. The gun culture is middle class, it's white, it's, it's I say rural, and then people think, oh, so it's the country, no wonder they don't kill each other. It includes urban centers that are just not hyper anti-gun. Plenty of cities like Phoenix, uh, like Grand Rapids, like Salt Lake City or Denver or Houston, or you know, these are not small cities, uh, but they don't restrict guns either, and so they don't have out of control crime. Um, the mass, the homicide rates in these urban centers among blacks drive up the average of the United States enormously. If you're not black and you don't live in an urban center, you're not of great risk of being killed by a gun unless you commit suicide, in which case you would do so whether you had a gun or not. Now, if we want to talk about that, that's the lion's share of the homicides. To be talking about these mass shootings, which are only a tiny fraction, makes no sense. Uh, if you want to address gun violence in the United States, that's the problem you have to address. And if you're going to talk about that problem, you don't talk about assault weapons because that's not what's being used. Uh, those murders are being are occurring with cheap handguns, cheap shotguns, and way down the list are rifles. Rifles are outnumbered by hands and feet in terms of preferred homicide weapon. So it makes absolutely no sense to be attacking big magazines and semi-automatic battle rifles. Those guns are hardly account for almost nothing in the homicide rate. The other thing you have to address is the war on drugs. Most of the crime is between gangs, and mostly what gangs are fighting over are, uh, are markets for the drug war, which they would not be fighting for if drugs were legal. Uh, this is 
plainly obvious, and I think this is the compromise liberals, because liberals supposedly are better on the drug war than conservatives, and I think conservatives who really value their gun rights and who want to be seen to be progressive on the issue as an olive branch should be willing, and this, I mean, this is just the right thing to do, but I'm just saying pl practical political politicking, strategic politics, say, okay, maybe we should legal start talking legalization. So the, because none of these assault weapons bans that they're talking about are magazine restrictions can plausibly reduce homicide as much as just lifting the war on drugs. I mean, it's in the name, war. And it literally is. Thousands of people die because of it every year. So let's end that war and we can see a significant drop in homicide. Now there are deeper causes to this, you know, because it takes something for a person to become a really bad criminal. And um, gosh, again, referencing this previous video, I'll just say it was Stefan Molyneux's video, which I was really surprised because he's famous for defooing, but he sounded like the most pro-family evangelical Christians I've ever listened to. Uh, but that's probably because the data when it comes to the stability of the family is essentially on their side. It doesn't have to do with being Christian or going to church, but if you have a single parent home, especially if it's a mother, the children of that home end up growing up with a much higher risk of becoming criminally involved, as in there's no single variable that can account for it more than that. That's something you need to address, and fortunately that's something the government can do about because it's very clear, at least it correlates very strongly, that government programs are what cause there to be so many single parent homes because they are subsidizing it. They pay women to have to raise children without fathers because if they don't, if they do have a father, they cut off the welfare. And this correlates the spike in crime, correlates with an increase in welfare distributed in this way. The part of the society that is targeted for this welfare are blacks, which is part of the reason they've they become uh, such a high part of the crime is because they have been targeted. Urban centers have been targeted and blacks live in urban centers, so they're doubly, um, it's a double whammy of government aid. And really, these people are fucked up because they grew up in single parent homes. It probably doesn't help that they go to public schools and live in public housing, although those are probably less directly affected and they're fucked up and whether you ban guns or not well it's not going to stop them from getting them as long as there's a war on drugs because then there's going to be flow of drugs and that's going to bring with it other necessities like guns uh, even if you were somehow to stem the, the tide they'd still be violent uh, messed up psychopaths who would find ways to commit, wreak havoc whether it was with implement, improvised guns which is possible too I mean, they can. I, there's a museum of. Uh, I've seen it on CNBC. There's a museum of a prison, of prisons, and they have all the shanks and stuff. And people have manufactured firearms in prison. Well, well, inmates. Uh, and you know, if these people are all shanking other people to death, I don't see how that's a, a, an improvement, rather than if they were just shooting them with nine millimeters. Uh, that's another thing that gun control people just bug the hell out of me. Like, well. What about the gun homicide? I don't see any reason to distinguish between gun homicide and other homicides. Um, if you say, oh, we banned guns, it had an effect. Yeah, they just started killing with knives. Good job. I mean, and then they became, they become, they uh, tend to become much bolder because if you do ban guns, then the likelihood that they will die in the commission of a crime from an armed victim drops dramatically. You know, unless they happen to attack a ninja master you know, or, or a, a professional wrestler or something, they're going to get away with it. But if there's a chance the person is armed, there's a chance they could end up dead, which means that many types of crime they will be reluctant and even never commit. So if you really want to talk about violence in America, you have to start addressing those issues and talking about the AR-15s that middle-aged white men in the suburbs like to buy and, uh, maybe compensate for something or, you know, just because they like to collect guns, which by the way is a lot of fun also, uh, is not addressing the problem at all. And 
it's suspicious in that regard to someone like me because Again, if you really cared about the gun violence in the United States, you'd be talking about the urban centers, you'd be talking about the drug war, you'd be talking about the subsidization of the breakup of the family. Uh, and that's what you would, if you really cared about gun violence, that would, that would be what you're talking about. When you start going after the weapons that are not really used in crime very often, in fact, among the rarest weapons used in crime at all, far less than knives or hands and feet, or even cheap hunting rifles, let alone shotguns or handguns, that looks more like an incrementalist approach to banning guns by picking minority, uh, you know, small segments and saying, okay, that's a small segment, we can get away with it. If they tried to ban all handguns, that's too big of a class of weapons, so let's pick this, let's incrementally just tighten the vice a little bit more, even though that will have no effect on actual violence, which leads people like me to conclude that that's the real the real goal is not to reduce violence or to reduce gun homicide or save children in schools it's to uh, reduce the number of guns so that and I think this is likely in the long run uh, Obama doesn't have to worry what's gonna happen during his executive orders where he can just think well I'm gonna do this and you know what's gonna happen if I what's gonna happen if I do and I'm not saying Obama, like it all began and ended with his presidency. This is a people in government want the government to have more power, and this would be an eventuality that they would like to achieve, even if they're not likely to get it in their particular uh, political life. It's something that they would want to work towards, and if even if they don't get that far, they can get part of the way. And he didn't start it; it's been going on a lot longer. Gun control in this history has goes before Obama was born. So, you know, don't think that I'm just putting it all on him. Republicans have been really bad about it. It seems with gun control, most of it does happen with Democrats, especially in the legislatures. But, you know, all of Bush's abuse of executive orders, that's inherited by Obama. And even if Bush never used it for guns, he set a precedent that Obama's happy to expand upon for guns. And I think that he, the banning of the big clips and the assault weapons so-called that's another point uh, again makes no sense and in terms of a strategy of reducing gun violence or anything like that it only makes sense in a strategy of re reducing the the fourth estate or the the pol potential political consequences of an armed populace you know and and people <laughs> like to I saw this little meme like oh yeah guns they're not any useful against the military and they showed all these pictures of like nuclear submarines and, and whatnot look a nuclear submarine has no use you know so if people started rebelling against the government you think they'd just start nuking the cities oh there's a couple hundred militia in an area with millions of loyal citizens in it let's just nuke the whole thing it's just absurd they, they have to go door to door against Americans and door to door is within range of these weapons. I'm not saying it would be pretty or good or we'd all end up like Red Dawn living in the woods leading a successful. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it wouldn't be near so pretty um, and and simple. It's not like all the people who would oppose the government would just get in a giant field and be like, here we are, shoot your ballistic missile at us so you can kill us without there being any consequences. No, it would be <laughs> urban warfare. It would be r rural warfare and it would be really ugly and everybody knows it even if one side thinks it's going to win, the cost of doing so would be really high, and no one wants to try and find out what it would end up being in the long run. Uh, so, and that's good. I think that it does. I think, I think that the, the scope of his executive orders demonstrates that there is uh, a hesitation to try for more. Uh, and that's good, but that doesn't mean I'm happy about the situation. And uh, I guess that's pretty much all I'm going to say about it for now.